All right. Well, now we turn to the most important uh, part of the evening, that's to get to our presentation with these two incredible researchers in maternity care. So I'm going to introduce and then I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Shuby. So first I'm going to introduce you to Esther Sharma. Esther Sharma is a UK registered midwife and research midwife at the University of Bedfordshire in the UK, where she is part of a team developing a tailored community-based intervention to increase access to antenatal care. She has 10 years of clinical experience in the UK and holds an MSc Public Health from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she is also pursuing doctoral research looking at maternity experiences of Afghan refugee women on the move. Our second presenter, who's actually going to present first, is Dr. Shubi Putaseri, is a reader in maternal and child public health and the director of the Maternal and Child Health Research Centre at the University of Bedfordshire in the UK. Her research focuses on improving access to and quality of health care for mothers, babies and families and for developing services and interventions for those who are most vulnerable and disadvantaged nationally and globally. I'm sure it is uh, so, it's such an honour uh, to see you all and to welcome all of you. And I'm going to hand over the uh, presenter rights uh, now to uh, Dr. Shubi. So let me just make sure you can see your slides and off you go. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much, Jane. And I'm just checking, can you all hear me okay? You sound great. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Jane. And um, first of all, thank you very much for having us. It is a really great pleasure um, to be able to speak to you all um, and to also to be able to listen to other speakers. Um, and to the listeners out there, to the audience, um, thank you for joining us. Um, it is absolutely lovely to know that, you know, um, there are listeners out from around the world. Um, so as Jane said, I'm Shubhi Putasheri. I am an Associate Professor in Maternal and Child Health, and also I am leading the uh, leading a Maternal and Child Health Research Centre at the University of Bedfordshire. Um, so Esther, Esther and I will be talking about an ongoing project um, that we are conducting to enhance antenatal care uptake um, in an ethnically diverse, socially disadvantaged area in the UK. Um, so the plan is I'll kick off with a quick overview of the project and Esther will follow on um, about, uh, about the intervention that we are currently rolling out um, in the community and we'll be happy to take um, questions in the end. So um, the, the overall aim of this project um, is to enhance um, timely initiation and optimum uptake of antenatal care um, in an ethnically diverse area in the UK. So the specific objectives are we wanted to understand why women are starting um, antenatal care late and why women do not attend um, the recommended number of antenatal care appointments um, in this in this area, I will talk about the area in a minute. Uh, talk about the area in a minute. Um, the second objective is to work with mothers, fathers, and maternity care providers, um, such as doctors and midwives, um, to jointly produce a tailored um, community-based initiative um, to help women to start antenatal care on time, and also to ensure that they have um, adequate antenatal care appointments. Um, so we are conducting this project in two phases. Um, in phase one, um, we analyzed routinely collected data from the local NHS maternity unit uh, on all women who gave birth over a nine year period. Um, firstly, to understand the patterns with respect to the timing of the start of antenatal care and also the factors that are associated with um, late antenatal care initiation. And in phase two, um, as I said before, we are rolling out an intervention that was co-produced with women and healthcare professionals to enhance the timely uptake of antenatal care. Um, so now about the area that we are um, focusing on. Um, as I said before, it's a very ethnically diverse area with approximately 55% of the population being of 
uh, black and minority ethnic origin. And the area is also ranked as the 59th most deprived area from about more than 300 local authorities in England, according to the indices of multiple deprivation. Um, and sadly, the health of um, people in this area is generally worse than the national average. Um, life expectancy for men and women are both lower than the national average. Looking at other um, outcomes, um, infant mortality rate in this area is higher um, than the national average. It's also the same with respect to babies born before term and also babies born with lower birth weight. And we did an initial mapping of areas with um, of the of antenatal care initiation in, in the postcode districts. And it was very, very clear that in some areas, very high proportions of women started antenatal care late. So now to tell you a little bit more about um, the phase one. What we did was we extracted data from the um, the maternity information system from the local hospital or over a nine year period. Um, and we un conducted analysis using it. It is part of a big project, but we conducted a, a data with respect to the timing uh, or the week of gestation when they started antenatal care and also how many antenatal care appointments they had. Um, so we analyzed about more than 45,000 births. Um, and what we found was that overall, um, more than one third of the births were to mothers from one of the ethnic minority groups, such as Black Caribbean, Black African, Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi background. Um, and great majority, um, over 85% lived in three most deprived area, uh, deprived area quintiles nationally. Um, and about one fifth or just over, a, over one fifth of the mothers had their first antenatal booking appointment later than 12 weeks. Um, and we also found that mothers from all ethnic minority groups were significantly more likely to have their booking appointment later than 12 weeks compared to white British mothers. And the highest proportion of late booking occurred among black African mothers, um, followed by mothers from black Arabian background. Uh, more than two thirds of the mothers who booked late lived in the two most deprived um, area quintiles. Um, we also found a link between um, late antenatal care initiation and infant outcomes. Uh, more than one fourth of preterm and low birth weight babies were born to mothers who started antenatal care late. Um, so I am going to stop there and um, pass on to Esther, who's going to talk about the uh, about our intervention. Thanks so much. Esther, you need to rejoin with your microphone. Sorry, I think when you went out, you just came back in with a headset. It's okay. It's joys, the joys of online meetings. You just need to click on the uh, little blue icon and just go through the login again. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, you sound perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Apologies for that. Okay, um, thank you, um, Shubi, for that introduction. And I'm going to, as Shubi mentioned, I'm going to be talking now about um, the actual intervention that we are um, currently rolling out. Um, so we started our work actually by. Um, in terms of thinking about how we developed the intervention by doing a, a quite a significant piece of co-production work. We wanted the local intervention to be very much um, co-produced with um, women and partners who have used maternity services recently and who are in living in the local area. So they know their local area best. They know their local maternity services. They've recently experienced it. And that was really important to us. So we conducted this this um, this a number of co-production um, workshops and conversations with um, with local women and partners um, in order to develop this tailor-made intervention um, to address the the um, women who are um, starting their antenatal care late or who aren't necessarily um, attending all of their midwifery appointments. Um, 
But we also, as well as engaging with women and uh, and their partners, uh, we also wanted to draw in local professionals as well, working with pregnant women in the local area. Um, so uh, what we did was we simultaneously held um, co-production workshops and conversations with both women and partners as well as professionals. So with the women, with respect to the, the, the co-production work we did with women and partners, we um, this was done last summer. So it's worth mentioning, uh, well, last early summer. So it's worth mentioning that this is off the back of some lockdowns um, that we had had, the COVID lockdowns that we'd had earlier in the year. So we had um, had to shift our, our plans a little bit. We had initially been planning to run face-to-face uh, -face focus groups in the community with a crash um, so that local women could come and and take part in these the uh, these kind of co-production co workshops but as it as 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 the situation stood because of the 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 pandemic we had to shift our uh, co-production methods quite significantly so we ended up taking a blended approach and actually that in itself was learning for us and, and certainly if you're doing co-production work um in your in your local areas this might be something that's that's of interest um so we ended up basically using fully remote um co-production methods and we had a combination of zoom online workshops um and one-to-one -one co production conversations um with women and partners so the the we ended up having three online workshops and then um, and then eleven one to one um, conversations. But the the great benefit we found of that was that we were able to really um, uh, be a lot more flexible um, rather than saying we're running a face to face co production workshop at a certain time at a certain place. Um, we were able to kind of be a lot more flexible to um, adjust around women's um work schedules if they were pregnant or all their babies naps if they'd recently had a baby and so on um and we also held um an externally facilitated work co-production workshop for uh local professionals and we had um 11 professionals attending that workshop from a really wide range of um of agencies so obviously we had midwives um, working in the local area, both community-based and hospital-based, but we also had um, the early years, the local early years provider. We had the leisure um, services because they actually run um, some exercise classes for pregnant women. We had um, the local youth um, service involved um, and, and some other agencies as well. So it was very broad. Um, which was 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 fantastic actually um and then we also held a couple of one-to-one -one conversations with people that weren't able to attend the the workshop um and in addition to that we ran a session with student midwives finally a student midwives and um and co-produced um ran a co-production workshop with them as well So the findings of the workshop were, were really interesting, actually. Um, one of the things that we unexpectedly found, particularly when running the co-production workshops and having those co-production conversations with, with women, was that it really provided for them a, a, a safe space to talk about, for many actually, the trauma of have, being pregnant and having a baby in the pandemic. Um, it wasn't what we intended, but um, as we, as we, we, we had these um, conversations, women just, the, the need just to talk about um, about their recent experiences in, in what they perceived as being safe space was, was very evident. Um, but in terms of the, the actual work that we were, we were um, the sort of the outcomes that we were looking for, we, um, we found that there were really kind of three areas that, um, that women and partners and professionals identified as um, as uh, aspects of um, early pregnancy um, that we could incorporate into our into developing our, our intervention so the first um, the first was the information about how to refer to antenatal care in the first instance and we did um, we did find that 
among a group of women, there was some confusion about what the referral pathway is and, and the referral process. Um, obviously, again, would have been um, more difficult, but, but this was, the difficulties about this were exacerbated because of the pandemic. Um, and because of the limited um, ability to be able to physically go to the GP or physically go um, without appointments to the hospital, for example. But there was definitely a need to understand how to refer to a midwife in the first place. Secondly, um, the other, another finding um, that emerged was how to access information and support in early pregnancy. And a lot of um, women talked about the sort of the gap in um, finding out they're pregnant and then and, and seeing um, the midwife for their first booking appointment um, and the, the gap in information and support. And again, particularly mental health um, support came out in um, quite a bit in conversations that we had with women. Um, again, I think exacerbated by the pandemic. But um, but but some of the, the key identify uh, key areas um, about this that were identified were how to care for yourself, what to expect in early pregnancy. Um, partners were saying they wanted more information about early pregnancy, that there was really nothing out there for them. Um, support for mental health, but also what to do in an emergency. Um, you know, what's the pathway if, uh, if a woman starts bleeding in early pregnancy, for example. And then finally, the timeline for pregnancy. So um, women were saying that they got all this information at booking about the timeline and what happens when, but that's an awful lot to take on in one go. And they would have found it helpful to um, have a more of a drip drip approach to this uh, information that's being provided and maybe kind of have a little bit more of a, a high level overview about um, the timeline for for pregnancy um, earlier on in early pregnancy rather than waiting for their booking appointment. So they wanted to know sort of what are the key, um, what are the key touch points, um, what are the key appointments, what happens when in their antenatal care. I will just say that another thing that we we found um, one of the, although we we did find one of the great advantages of being able to of, of doing this co-production work remotely was as I mentioned, our ability to be very flexible and take a very flexible approach. The disadvantage was that we weren't able to engage with women who are potentially digitally excluded. Um, so that is something that we would have been able to hopefully um, do if we were holding face-to-face -face workshops. But unfortunately, um, we weren't able to do that. But that's, um, we did, we did um, attempt to, um, to draw women in who, don't have access to the internet, but it was very, very difficult to, to do that, and we weren't successful in that, in that respect. So, as a result of our co-production workshops, we then went on to develop our intervention, our community-based, tailored intervention to increase uptake of antenatal care and early initiation of antenatal care. And so, in developing this, we thought about, we thought of it in three ways. So firstly, the message, what do we need to say? Secondly, the medium, what kind of resources will we use to say it? And thirdly, the method, how will we say it? Obviously, there's some overlap in that, but those are the, the three kind of key um, aspects of the intervention that we considered when we developed, the, when we developed it. So in terms of the message, I mean, I won't go over all of this. I've mentioned quite a bit of it already, but it was it was about very much about kind of what to do after a positive pregnancy test, the referral mechanisms, the timelines, local support and contacts, um, self care, and and what to contact if there's if there's any problems or concerns. In terms of the medium, um, some of the things that were talked about were targeted social media ads, online information, um, posters in, for example, specifically in kind of women's spaces like um, women's gyms or, um, you know, on the back of um, toilet doors and things like that. Um, a couple of our of our um, of, of women who, who took part in the in the internet, uh, the co-production workshops had an idea about having business cards, very discreet, small cards that could be um, left near, for example, near pregnancy tests, so that if a woman finds out she's pregnant, she can also um, uh, receive that information in a very sort of simple, straightforward way. 
messaging about leaflets came out loud and clear from both the professionals and um and the women and partners um generally people found leaflets are really unhelpful not very user friendly um often their experience of leaflets was that the language wasn't very straightforward or human um and so we we've got a, a loud and clear message that people don't want more leaflets with lots of information on it um people also wanted to receive the 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 information um through peers and through peer support and early pregnancy groups and also through faith leaders as well and finally the method so we um as I mentioned, um, written that we got a lot of feedback about written information needing to be um, more easy to read, understand, e and easy to understand, more visual, um, using community languages. Um, and we have developed a, a range of written material, but not leaflets. Um, so we've, um, as you can see in this slide, um, we've developed these. Um, uh, cards um slightly larger than business cards so we could incorporate all the information that was important but still they're, they're fairly small um small cards and we've we've had this translated into the main community languages and it really it's got the visuals on there um it just says if you're pregnant um to, to summarize anyway it just says if you're pregnant you need to um start antenatal care within 10 weeks of pregnancy which is the um the, record, the, the, the national guidelines in the UK here. And, and then on the back of the business card, um, it, there's information about how to refer via a GP or via um, self-referral mechanisms. And one of the things that, from our co-production work that women talked about was the, the challenge in, in accessing GP, um, GP services at the moment because of the pandemic and and not being able to have that face-to-face -face contact with the GP who would then in order for the GP to refer them to midwifery services but also um, you know for some women using the online self-referral form just isn't feasible it's um, it, they maybe don't have, have access to um, to a smartphone or a computer where they can complete quite what's quite a lengthy form. Um, so we've um, we've incorporated a, a phone number that women who have difficulties either in accessing a GP or, or completing the online referral form, a phone number where they can uh, phone and refer themselves by phone and that's something particularly that non-English speaking women um, would find help from which is identified in our co-production work. Um, and and we've also um, incorporated an, an element of, of verbal information as well as part of our intervention. So instead of just kind of indiscriminately handing out um, handing out information or leaflets or anything like that, we very much engage with people, um, have a discussion with them, and and communicate those key messages. Um, and that's been in a range of a range of settings. So moving on to that then, um, in terms of actually delivering the intervention, which is the phase of, stage of the of the project that we're in now, we've um, recruited. We had we've just come to an end of, of that stage, but we had recruited um, three volunteer antenatal care champions, who were a mixture of final year student midwives and newly qualified midwives, and I was working with them to actually deliver the intervention. And we did that in a number of different ways, um, but mainly through either one-to-one -one, um, conversations with people, um, through street engagement, or um, through engaging with people in areas of high footfall, or through group community sessions. Um, so just to sort of paint the picture a little bit of what that might look like, uh, we may go to a shopping centre or, um, uh, for example, stand outside a local library or community centre, um, where there's areas where there's really high uh, footfall in the community. And we would engage with people one to one and have conversations about, with the community as a whole, about um, why antenatal, early antenatal care is important and how um, to access antenatal care. And, and just to emphasise again, this isn't just information we're giving to women or to women who are pregnant. This is information that we're giving to everyone because one of the things that sort of came out from our co-production work was the fact that um, 
when women find out they're pregnant, they may not know what to do, so they ask friends or family members for information and advice. So we wanted to make sure that the whole community has that information. So if a woman finds out she's pregnant and talks to a family member, they can say, oh, well, actually, um, I recently found out through talking to uh, somebody in the high street that this, this is, these are the steps you can take to uh, refer to a midwife, for example. So uh, we've also run, as I said, group community sessions. So, um, for example, we've been working with a local Roma organisation. Um, we know that there are particular issues about access to antenatal care for women in the Roma community. So we work quite closely with them to deliver some um, group sessions um, to their beneficiaries in one of their community spaces. And um, we've also delivered a training session to them specifically so that they're then able to provide um, information to beneficiaries that they're working with when we're maybe not around. So in terms of the next steps then, um, we are just coming to the end of, of actually delivering that intervention. So the next step um, we've been will be really to evaluate um, the intervention. Um, we're, we've got quite a, a broad evaluation package, some of which has been actually sort of happening um, simultaneously to the intervention delivery and some of which will, will happen afterwards. Um, so we really want to find out, first of all, how consistently are we delivering the intervention? Um, there's obviously a number of us involved and we want to make sure that we're all saying the same things, giving out the same key messages and making sure that we are communicating um, the, the same things, even though we might be working in different um, contexts and different times. Also, how acceptable is the intervention so, uh, to, to those who receive it? And, and these two things we've been doing um, simultaneously to actually uh, delivering the intervention. So we have um, a, a short, very easy to use um, survey that we ask people who have we've spoken to um, to complete and in terms of the intervention fidelity um, we are observed um, in terms of how well we're how, how consistently we're delivering the intervention and then we're going to do some um, after we finished our intervention delivery we'll be um, conducting some semi-structured interviews and questionnaires um, and, uh, and focus groups to really understand the experiences of those who those who receive the intervention um, in more depth and then finally, we'll run a further data analysis to understand what difference in terms of sort of the actual data has the intervention made. So that brings me to a close now. And um, we're very happy to take, thank you for listening. We're very happy to take any questions. And, and while um, the audience uh, is thinking of their questions, and as our last facilitator said, we see a few people in the audience that we can call on who are very experienced midwives, so I'm sure they've got some thoughts. Um, so I, I work in uh, as a clinician full time now, and um, I'm not sure, are you familiar with the concept, um, Sharon Rising's concept of centering pregnancy that was developed at Yale? Because I think that's something that might, as you're able to bring more people effectively and early into prenatal care, um, centering actually focuses very much on what you said. It's, uh, it's called centering pregnancy and it's group prenatal care uh, where we facilitate groups um, and uh, they actually get about 10 times as much education typically. And they tend to be um, folks that you might norm not normally associate with attending uh, regular prenatal care. So I wondered if you've heard about centering and if that's something that you actually have in the UK. Shabi, do you, shall I um, go ahead? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jane. Um, as far as I'm aware, I mean, Jane, would you like to tell us what this concept is about? Do you said it's centering? Yeah, so in the 90s, um, there was a midwife at Yale who did her research uh, on on what you just said about 
trying to enhance prenatal care for folks that you might not normally associate with being very uh, good at showing up or attending or feeling safe. Um, so she developed, she actually wrote this as part of her, I think it was her doctoral thesis when she was at Yale, and it's called Centering. And you can actually do it for any kind of medical or any kind of issue, but you actually do group uh, prenatal care where you come in, the client and their partner will have their private visit for a few minutes, but the actual delivery of the education, um, the intervention is that they're teaching themselves and they're all at the same uh, amount of weeks. So they're all due about the same time. So you're, you're delivering, it's exactly following along with, from what you just said. So I think it's something that would be very interesting um, maybe to integrate uh, in your groups when you've, well, captured the wrong word, but when you've successfully got these folks to start coming, then this is like a gift to them to say, this is for you and you're going to run and be the facilitators and kind of teach yourself about the importance of health and um, feeling safe and talk about intimate partner violence and talk about STIs and everything else. It's a very comprehensive educational um, way of, of learning about wellness in pregnancy and birth. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jane. No, it is a very interesting concept. And see what our grounding philosophy is that we are trying to kind of take services into the community and also to places which have traditionally been kind of not viewed as places to you know to 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 disseminate health messages for example as esther said you know shopping centers um street engagement or places of worship i mean traditionally this has not been you know seen as places where we can you know kind of provide health services from so one of the things that we are learning is that when we take um this kind of services or messages out into the community um again as Esther said we are in the process of doing this evaluation but I think really the, 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 the sense that we're getting is it gets a lot more acceptable and it also you know I mean we're talking about women who fail to reach health services so the whole concept of taking it out into the community and also this co-production that we have um, used um, and that is also kind of very, very important, especially when you're working with women from diverse ethnicity um, and you know, cultural backgrounds, women who are new to the country. And, you know, we're talking about women who actually fail to reach the health service. So, um, again, the UK, I mean, from as far as we know, there are in many projects which have adopted this kind of similar approach. Um, so, in a way, we are testing whether this is going to work. And... The, the feeling, I mean, Esther can add more to that. Um, the, the, the perspectives that we get is, or the sense that we're getting is that this is going to be, I mean, this is successful, and this is feasible. Um, and this is probably, I mean, the next stage is, is, to, is, to, is to test this more at a national level, because at the moment we are focused on a small area. Um, so our feeling is that this is an approach going forward to capture you know um, vulnerable and disadvantaged women um, this would you know work um, in terms of enabling them to access maternity care on time um Esther, do you want to add anything in terms of um, the evaluations and reflections just um yeah i mean i think um I think that's sort of broadly covered it. Um, I think it's interesting what you say, Jane, and I know there's certainly been um, another big study in the UK to look at group antenatal care, for example. Um, I suppose our piece is just just before that. It's about sort of getting getting women in the first instance um, rather than the piece about what happens when they're in. Um, so I'll focus on that a little bit just before. And as Shubi said, I mean, there really, really has been, there's been work done in this area um, in low and middle income countries, but almost nothing as, as far as we're aware, certainly nothing that's been written up in the peer reviewed literature, at least um, to really understand you know what we can do about this issue about women in high income countries who aren't engaging um till quite late with maternity services and it's certainly been been quite um interesting kind of hearing a very very wide range of reasons why that might be in, in this 
particular in the particular area that we're um, we're researching. But um, I think yeah, yeah Ella, I Ella, Ella's, Ella's got a really timely <coughs> timely question. It just jumps into that, and it's it's mostly about your research. And I don't know if you can speak to, but Ella Kane ask are you able to explore reasons why women uh choose not i guess do not choose or choose not to access services so i know that's that's something that's probably if we could all solve that problem we wouldn't all be sitting here but uh i'd love to hear or we'd all love to hear if you've got any reasons why you think they're not um feeling safe to access our services she be um, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean the systematic review that we are conducting, Esther is leading on that. So, um, Esther, that would be something. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, certainly from our um, from the conversations we've had with women, um, I mean, I think thank you, Ella. That's a, just a really interesting question, and I suppose there's two there's two aspects um, to it that I that I'm sort of that come to mind. Um, so your specific question was um, reasons why women do not choose to access services. So in terms of that, certainly from our work, what we found is um, from our co-production work, um, we've certainly found that among some groups of women, there is a huge amount of fear about engaging with maternity services. Um, and the fear being that they will be charged so this is something that we're we're probably uh, quite a few of us will be familiar with um but particularly for migrant communities there's a big big issue about charging in the uh, in the nhs um so although maternity care should be free at the point of use um there's uh, concerns among some migrant communities that they will be that they will be charged um and um and there's also there's the, it was interesting actually um also that that maybe in for women who come from countries where health systems run quite differently, expectations are are different. So, for example, um, you know, in some countries where women would have a named uh, medical-led um, maternity care, they may see the same doctor over and over, be able to because it's maybe under a private system, be able to access the doctor whenever they want. Whereas, um, and I, whereas in the NHS, it's, it's um, there isn't always that continuity, and um, it's maybe not as accessible in this same kind of way always that that maybe women have previously experienced. Um, the other the other sort of point um, to your question is sort of thinking about it. Oh, you've just left another comment. Thank you. Would there be other reasons for British-born women? Um, there would be, and certainly, you know, kind of in the wider research, there there are reasons that are identified. I mean, that's um, that's uh, so. For example, what, is, um, what we found as well from some of the conversations we had were um, some women talked about from South Asian backgrounds talked about um, the evil eye and um, not wanting to talk about pregnancy um, because of fear of what may happen to the baby. Um, if they talk about their pregnancy early on. Um, there's certainly a lot in the literature, so not what we've kind of found directly through our, um, our um, primary research, but, um, but certainly from our systematic review of the literature, there's, you know, we know that there are um, systemic uh, and structural factors um, that impact why women don't um, engage with British born women don't engage with maternity services, um, which are very wide ranging, it's probably slightly beyond the, the scope of of, um, of the discussion tonight, but certainly there absolutely there are there are structural factors. There's we know that there's institutional racism, we know that there's um, uh, language barriers, we know that there's um, women have been treated badly before and whether that's maternity care or or in the health system in in general and they're not wanting to um, understandably uh, repeat those those experiences and um, so yeah I mean I think there's there's a wide a uh, whole other a uh, whole other discussion um, there to be had but yeah absolutely thank you for your question Ella 
And I think I just put in a request for our turn performance next year so that we can hear uh, more from how your um, co-production is going. Because I think, you know, I think, as I said at the start, I think this is a, a universal issue where women have felt not safe or not heard and uh, how can we how can we include everyone in the conversation so that they're able to effectively take care of themselves and their baby so um i think and um, we're about to wrap up so um and ella says this is an excellent project that needs to be widened so let's i'll give a big hand to esther and dr shuby fantastic we heart you we wish you all the best uh, with your ongoing uh, research and uh, Thank you so much uh, to everyone uh, involved and thanks for coming and thanks for your engagement in the conversation. So I'm going to